Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and as you've probably heard by now, the Soyuz has had a major launch failure, resulting in the crew having to abort and land. The crew are safe. So, Soyuz MS-10 was going to go to the space station. It was carrying cosmonaut Alicia Ovechinin and Nick Haig. There were only two crew on this flight because uh, Roscosmos has been running uh, on lower budget than they would like. And uh, yeah, it seems that about, uh, well, two minutes into flight is roughly when you have stage separation. And it seems that something went wrong with stage separation. Now, the, uh, the Soyuz is based on an old 1950s rocket called the R7. And back then, they weren't really sure that they could light major booster engines in flight. In fact, they were lighting the engines with what is essentially big matchsticks. And it was pretty common back then, don't worry. Um, so they would light all the engines on the ground and about two minutes into flight these would peel off and spin off and this would form what's called the Korolev Cross, a beautiful sight in the sky of the main core booster heading off into space while the spent booster spun off in four different directions. In this case something was clearly wrong. The separation was asymmetric. It looked to me like the core was actually slewing across. And there's another bit of footage I've seen which shows a cloud of propellant around the staging, which could definitely be an indication of an impact and a tank rupture. Now, if you actually watched this live on NASA TV, it was a little confusing because you had a canned animation showing everything was all right. You also had a NASA commentator who was clearly reading off a script. At two minutes, she said, the launch tower has been jettisoned. Meanwhile, the Russian translator is translating the astronauts and they're talking about being weightless. So the engine had failed by that point. So some places are reporting that the launch escape tower had been jettisoned. That is not the case as far as I can tell. They would have had plenty of time to make sure that didn't happen and then exploit it. Now, because this happened just after stage separation, they would have only been going about 5,000 feet per second, whatever that is, but that's what NASA says. Um, they would not have been particularly high, and so they would have performed what's called a ballistic re-entry as opposed to a guided re-entry. Um, normally, when you're going fast sideways in one of these capsules, it doesn't fall straight down. What you do is you use the aerodynamic properties of the capsule to uh, get some lift and control your descent through the atmosphere so you don't experience high Gs. When it's going this slowly, and I, you know, it's not that slow, but it's slow enough that this thing essentially falls straight down and it can't really get any ballistic, any aerodynamic lift. So the crew experienced about seven Gs. Uh, they took a bit of time to find them, but they apparently landed about 500 kilometers downrange, about 20 kilometers east of a place called Jezgagan, uh, which is in Kazakhstan. And actually, this, this place is quite used to recovering astronauts because they'll stage out of there when they're recovering astronauts that are returning from space. So yeah, crew are safe. I mean, we've seen plenty of pictures of them relaxing in the hotels, and, and Nick Haig has already been meeting with the, uh, you know, the director of NASA. So that's all good. I mean, this is a good story that the booster did fail, but the crew escaped safely. And this is actually the first time that a launch escape system has been successfully used by a crew in flight. Soyuz has actually had two previous failures with crew involved. Uh, one was in 1975. It was a 7KT number 39. After uh, the... Yeah, wait, Second and third stage failed to separate, and then when the third stage fired its engine, it the whole thing started spinning. By that point, they had lost the launch escape system, so the capsule re-entered, and you know, amusingly enough, in the Keystone Cops kind of way, the capsule ended up landing on a hillside. It began rolling downhill towards a giant cliff, and the crew were only saved because the parachutes entangled in trees. Uh, in 1983, Soyuz 10 T-10A caught fire on the launch pad and the launch escape system did save the crew who of course immediately turned off the cockpit recorders so that they could scream obscenities without going on the record. So look, this is big problem for the space station. It's come at an unfortunate time. As I said, Roscosmos only put one crew on there. There's a spare seat that nobody uh, paid for. The current crew in the space station is fine, they have supplies, you know, they can stay there for as long as they like, but 
the Soyuz that they came up in can only stay in space for 200 days. So they launched on June 6th. That means mid-December they have to return home because the Soyuz descent vehicle, return vehicle, will be by its sell-by date. The Soyuz is the only vehicle right now that can put crew on the space station. In the US, Dragon and Starliner are still months away from being ready to fly. And I do not see NASA pushing this forward. Um, so the question is, what happens to the crew in space? Well, they could return home early and leave the ISS empty. That would be the first time that there haven't, hasn't been people in space in a very long time. And, and the problem with this is the ISS is not some simple satellite. It does need maintenance. In fact, some spacewalks that were planned for maintenance uh, were going to require Nick Haig. So now they've lost him. We don't know whether those can go ahead. This will lead to rescheduling. So yeah, without the crew, it's not guaranteed that the ISS is going to remain in working condition for long enough for them to get crew back up there. Uh, another option is that they could just run through their investigation really quickly in a couple of months and then launch crew to the station. That might be possible, but um, you know, normally I would say that the Soyuz has, has, had had such a long and reliable history that I would actually feel completely comfortable like if they just stood up a Soyuz tomorrow and you know asked astronauts to volunteer for it because this does seem like a pretty freak occurrence, but you know, Soyuz MS-9 has had this whole issue with the hole in it, and it does start to feel a little like the conspiracy theorists might have something with their whole, like, sabotage thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would get into Soyuz tomorrow right now, but I, I could see that they investigate this and decide to fly again. A third option is that they could, if the investigation isn't complete, they could actually send up an unmanned, an uncrewed, Soyuz and have it autonomously docked to the station so that they can return the other one and then still have a lifeboat to return the crew so the crew could stay on orbit much longer. That would certainly be an interesting option. It would also serve as a test to demonstrate the reliability of Soyuz. So that is actually a, not such a ridiculous option. So look, there's a lot of uh, misreporting going on right now because the the video is very low quality, the telemetry isn't public. I mean, this is one of the things, when you look at a SpaceX launch, you get the telemetry that's telling you the speed, you have these amazing cameras. When you look at a Soyuz, the cameras are live and then from that point on, the animation is canned and it doesn't really give you any real information. And it's in Russian and I, I don't speak Russian. I'm sure there are people that follow me that uh, speak Russian and knew exactly what those uh, cosmonauts were saying. I would love to know your ideas of what was going on because the details of went on, what went on inside there will certainly be the subject of debate for a long time. So yeah, I mean, this was absolutely fascinating. I actually, yesterday, last night, had recorded a video and hit like render at midnight and then had got to sleep because I was just too tired. I was super excited about what I considered to be a big space news day yesterday with the, the funding of Newell Glenn, uh, Vulcan and uh, Omega. But uh, boy... Was I to be proven wrong? That was the best, the most interesting, the biggest news. I'm going to say the best is yet to come. The biggest news was yet to come. I woke up with like 5,000 notifications from all my social media. So yeah, I, I hope this has answered some of your questions. And uh, yeah, you can actually go and watch my other video about the funding of New Glenn and all that. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.